My name is John Stenhouse. I'm the Business Support Manager at the University of Essex, University Enterprise Zone, where we run two programmes, uh, Space to Grow Investment Readiness and the Angels at Essex Equity Investment Platform. And today I have with me Josh Clark, who is um, supporting us and sorting out the IT so that I don't break it, and with Jay Kajuria from PwC Ray's Ventures, who is our guest speaker today. Now, the subject matter today is market sizing. Um, basically, this is getting your business ready for investment, okay? And it's actually one of the fundamental things that you need to do before you do much else, to be honest with you. But we'll have more of that later when we talk to Jay and uh, see his presentation. So I'd like now to introduce you to Jay, who is with PwC Raise Ventures. Now, Jay is the program manager there. And he advises high growth startups on capital fundraising. Um, he's got a law from a law degree from Durham University. He's been involved with fintech, pharma, retail, uh, worked with Fortune 500, and also SMEs. Now, as mentioned at the beginning, market sizing is actually fundamental to valuing the proposition that you are putting forward to investors. And remember, investors. You need to check this. So let's see, what are you worth? Jay, introduce yourself, please, and tell us all about market sizing. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, John and Josh, and thanks a lot for having me here today. Um, pretty much as John mentioned, I work as part of PwC Raise Ventures, which is a specialist team within our corporate finance practice advising companies and raising their initial seed, Series A and Series B rounds. Um, very much, as John mentioned, I think market sizing is very much at the core and the crux off when you go into fundraising, but also when you're developing your business, because it helps you really understand what your business is all about and who you're really selling the business to. Before I kind of go into my presentation, um, as a history, I used to be a consultant, so I've got lots of slides, but I'm going to try to be more discussion focused and kind of try to pinpoint less to the slides and try to be more open and direct. Um, but just to give you an idea of what I'm planning to cover today and a very old photo of me on the right side when I didn't have a beard. Um, but towards the left, I'm trying to cover about five key things in this sort of market sizing space. So very much going into what's market sizing and how you think about market sizing and what methodologies you apply all the way into how your market growth feeds into this. And then obviously the big question, which I focus a lot on is what's the implication of this when you talk about fundraising, because obviously the investor angle is what I look at and what most investors will obviously look at when they're valuing your business. And then lastly, what I believe is I think something which actually brings your entire business together, which is your value proposition, which very much feeds from your market size, but all the way through understanding what your problem is, what your solution is, and how that kind of fits in together. So before I go into this detailed one, um, just a quick one to give you an idea of who I am and what my team does in my background. But essentially, I sit as part of PwC Raise, where we kind of advise companies pretty much on the 1 to 30 million side of things. I know, as John mentioned, a lot of companies in the call today are probably going to be quite a varied range. And a lot of you probably don't know what investment you're looking for when you're looking for this. And I'm going to try to keep this high level and give you an understanding of what we do. Uh, but essentially, our actual practice is focused more on doing one to one support with mostly companies looking to raise one to 30 million, helping them understand how to raise the funding, working with pitch decks and financial models and the long lines. And just some stuff over here, if you're interested, I'm sure John can link you in with more stuff later. If I start thinking about market sizing at a very high level and talking about, I guess, why you really need market sizing and why it's important. So I think there's a few bits to it. So like I mentioned, market sizing is quite important to understand who your customers are and how you're targeting them. And it shows to investors the potential for your business, but also trying to understand what might be the barriers to entry, what might be the other players in the market, what kind of market share and what kind of target market you're going for and helping them in very much essence, understand who your product is really targeted to, because quite often, even though you might think your product is targeted to say as a B2B, pretty much anyone who uses software, there's always a much more defined and specific market coming out there. And if I think of it from a very much investor point of view, I think there's two aspects to it. So one, investors want to understand how much room for growth there is in the vertical you're targeting. And they also want to understand what the potential returns might be. So obviously, you've got different kinds of investors all the way from VCs to EIS, VCD funds to angels to corporate ventures and a whole lot of other investors out there. A lot of you might already spoken to them. A lot of you might actually be working with them regularly. 
But it's important to understand that they all care about market sizing, but they all might care about market size in a slightly different way. So as an example, a VC might care about a market size which is much larger because they might want to look for, say, an 8 or a 10x return, while, say, an EIS or VCD fund looking for maybe a 3 to 5x return might be okay with a smaller market size. And obviously, all of them care slightly differently about what we call TAM, SAM, and SOM in the market sizing world. Um, but I will get to that in a minute. So I know I'm kind of like going to try to take this slow, going to try to ease you into market sizing in the various bits and pieces. And I think a good way to kind of give you a wide overview of it is to tell you how I go about doing a market sizing and hopefully that give you an idea of how you can go about doing it for your own business. So the way you think about it is very much step one, which is making sure that the market you're targeting or the defined market you have in your mind is very much indicative of your customers. Don't try to put in too much in your market size and try to say, hey, we're targeting 100 different types of customers when in reality your business only targets, say, five or six. And I say this point quite importantly because people will call you out on something which you're saying wrong. You don't want to try to lie or try to like shift the truth and try to make it seem larger. So be honest about it. Be honest about what you're targeting and try to define your market and your customers in the beginning. The second part, which is deciding on your approach, which is what kind of market sizing approach you want to take. So there's a lot of approaches we focus on. So you've kind of got your bottom up and you've got your top down approaches and within your sort of bottom up approach, you've got a demand and supply based approach. I'm going to come into in a bit more detail. And then once you've kind of got your approach in your mind, you start thinking about your TAM, SAM, and SOM, which is very much understanding your sort of total market, um, your acquirable market, and also kind of understanding the current existing market. And then lastly, as I mentioned, like every investor has a slightly different focus. So it's important to understand what kind of investor you're targeting and understand what the variation in market size might be. So I know I've thrown a lot of definitions at you. I've thrown a lot of like high level acronyms at you, but don't worry. I'm going to be going into detail and kind of trying to pick them out and explain them slightly more simplistically, hopefully, to you. And John, Josh, if at any point you think I'm going too technical, feel free to call me out and I'll try to simplify it for everyone on the call. So let's start out with thinking about TAM, SAM, and your current market. So the way I think about it is your TAM is a very theoretical value, which is if you imagine 100% of people who could potentially buy your product or your software would buy your product, that is your TAM, which is essentially pretty much anyone you could hypothetically target. Your SAM starts getting a bit more drilled down, which is it's anyone who would realistically buy your product. So as an example, I like to think of smartphones, which is realistically or theoretically, anyone could buy a smartphone, but there's probably about five or 10% people in the world. It might be they can't use it. They don't like technology. They don't live in areas with connectivity who would just never buy a smartphone. And that kind of comes with your SAM. And then lastly, which is your current market value, which is very much understanding what the current market is, where you're operating and what the size of that is. So I like to use the chocolate bar example over here, which is your current market isn't how many people could eat chocolate or how many people could buy a chocolate bar, but rather how many chocolate bars were sold this year in whatever market you're focusing. So this is kind of a very high level one. So TAM is essentially anyone possibly buying your product. SAM is kind of people realistically who would adopt your product even either now or in the future. And your current market or some, depends on what terminology you like using, everyone has their own preferences, is how much is the market actually worth today? And these three get really important when you start drilling down into detail about your market size, because while your TAM is quite theoretical and realistically something which is not the first thing investors look at, it's still important to have because that just shows that there is a massive market out there broadly. I think it's the SAM and current market which get really important when you are talking to investors and also thinking about your business. Um, and if I move into why this is the reason, so obviously, as I mentioned, the TAM is something which is a potential opportunity, which is massive, and it's kind of just like a big number you throw out there quite often just to make it seem like you have a massive business and you can do a lot of things. But then the SAM and your current market is where it gets a bit more detailed. So as an example, when you talk about your SAM, and I said potential adopters, this gets really important, especially if you're a disruptive player. So as I saw, a lot of you are B2Bs, and I'm assuming hopefully a lot of the B2B softwares are kind of new players in the space or something which hasn't been done before. And your SAM shows the potential market which you could acquire or target. And I think my favorite example in this is if I talk about the carbon storage market. So example, one of my clients about 10 years ago when they might have started out in carbon storage, people weren't really talking about carbon storage. There wasn't really a current market. There weren't really too many players in carbon storage. But if you look at the SAM or the potential market which could be targeted, it was massive. It was in the trillions. But obviously, if you go to an investor at that point with just your current market and not your SAM, they won't really see that space for growth. And then lastly, obviously, your current market is very much where are you right now? What is the existing market? 
And it depends on what kind of product you're servicing. So exa as an example, I said, if it's a disruptive product, your current market might be small, but your SAM is gonna be a larger number. While if, for example, you're in a mature market. So um, I don't know, as an example, if I use something like ad tech, which is a slightly more mature market, the current market might actually be slightly larger and the SAM might also be quite similar to the current market or there might not be too much room for growth. So I've quite often seen companies in those mature markets actually use the current market as their SAM but that's fine as long as you can show that what you're doing in that mature market is slightly different or you've got space to grow or all the players don't actually have the entire market share. And what I think is the most important in my mind is kind of that headroom when you talk about disruptive businesses, which is showing an investor that this is the current market. You're gonna be A, targeting parts of the current market with your competitors, but then B, you're gonna be targeting that entire headroom. And that's where the real growth potential comes up in these disruptive businesses, because it's showing this is what is spent currently this is how much people could be spending. And that's what really excites investors when they start looking at your pitch deck. So hopefully this gives you a very high level idea of, I guess, Sam Tam and current market and why in my mind, and hopefully other people's minds, those are kind of important concepts. And I'll maybe go into an example and I'll use my B2B SaaS example, given the audience. So think of it as your Tam is very much, let's imagine any company with 10 to 500 FTEs purchasing your B2B HR SaaS platform right now. And then if you think about it, realistically, all of those won't purchase it right now because some people might already have that product, but might have a different HR platform. Some people might not have the resources or the money to actually buy that HR platform. Some people like, for example, a coffee shop might not actually need a detailed HR platform for SaaS when they can probably use a more simpler management rota. So it's understanding and eliminating those people who might not adopt it today and might not ever adopt it when you think about your SAM. And then your current market comes down to what is the actual current spend in HR software in the business. So basically it comes down to you've got your massive SAM, which is any company between 10 to 500, drilling down to companies which would realistically invest in an HR software, and then drilling further down into how many companies currently have an HR software. And this is how you kind of segment your market size and help investors understand what's the room for growth, what your current market is and what the potential is. And the sustainable fashion example, again, more of a B2C fashion, but essentially, again, thinking about what's the money spent on sustainable fashion, understanding who are the kind of people who would never buy sustainable fashion for whatever reasons, and then understanding how much is currently spent in sustainable fashion. And just another way of showing it is kind of like a more graphic way of showing how you drill down, but A is kind of the entirety of your box. B is you're slightly drilling down and slightly eliminating companies which are too small or too large for you. And then C is kind of understanding what your core sectors are. So it's just kind of these approaches when you talk about market sizing, which make it really useful. And I find this kind of graphic representation in my mind often helps me understand what I'm drilling down to and understanding my current market and my SAM. And the way you often present it, so I'm sure some of you might be thinking about pitch decks and investments and how you present your market size to investors. So there's no real right or wrong approach to explaining your market size, but I'm gonna to flick to like two examples, which I think are a nice way to show it. So one is your very straightforward example and investors have seen quite love this because it's just very straightforward and direct, but at a very high level, it gives you your current market, your SAM and your TAM. And probably worth, I don't know if I've mentioned the actual full forms of them earlier, but the full forms are your current market, your serviceable addressable market and your total addressable market. I know they're slight mouthfuls. That's why we kind of use the short forms typically. Um, this is a very simplistic way of doing it, which I've seen in lots of pitch decks. The next one is probably an approach which I like using personally, just probably from my previous strategy days and kind of understanding and showing that little graphical differentiation between TAM, SAM and your current market. And this is quite nice because you can kind of show the projection, you can show that headroom quite clearly to investors. And I've quite often seen people just add a little arrow to show that headroom to. Um, obviously in lots of cases, the SAM and the current market, like I mentioned in mature markets might be about the similar height, but that's completely fine. Um, one probably thing to add when you talk about these three things, and I mentioned earlier too, but just be realistic about your market, be realistic about who you're targeting and just be honest about it and make sure you actually do your research into what this sizing is. So that's the sort of high level theoretical approach of what your market size is and how you calculate it. But now I'm gonna drill down into a bit of understanding what the methodologies are and how do you actually put those numbers on your SAM, TAM and current market. So at a very high level on methodologies, I'm just gonna skip through a few of these. Like I mentioned, you've got your bottom-up and top-down approaches. So typically I and a lot of other people prefer using a bottom-up approach. And the way you can do it is kind of your demand-based market sizing, which is quite straightforward. The way you think about it is very much volume into price. 
and the volume in this case might be the number of customers, how often they purchase any given product or software, and multiplied by the pricing. And again, with SaaS, you might have different pricing models, so that comes to another level of kind of differentiation between it. And then you've got your supply-based approach, which works, but I think in certain scenarios, not in every scenario, but usually this is when you're finding what the market size is of the market leader, and then you're trying to essentially do some maths and figure out what 100% would be. So as an example, in the gaming industry, let's say hypothetically Nintendo has maybe a 25, 30% market share, and it's like a publicly available report, which says that you can do some multiplication to try to understand what the entire market would be. But again, supply-based um, supply approach tends to be a bit rarer and not often used by people, and you do need very accurate data for such an approach. If I kind of break down into how you really think about volume and price, so this is kind of what we like doing is a bit of like a volume and price driver tree. So this is something which is not just important for market sizing, but also really important to understand your business, which is if you think about your business, what is driving the volume in your business and what is driving the product of your business or your or the price of your product, sorry. Um, and that's really important to understand both how your business is operating and how your business is growing, but also helps you understand and build out your market size in this scenario. So as an example, when you think about volume drivers, there could be a lot of them, and I'll come to it in a minute and kind of go through what some of those volume drivers could be in a hypothetical business and what those price drivers could be. And I think even generally, when you think about something like this, even though you might show an investor initially, just a simple deck which shows your current market and your potential market growth, investors, when you get into sort of first conversation, second conversations, they would expect to see some more detailed research and some more detailed breakdown as to why that's the market size and kind of how you've gone about doing it. On to the actual numbers. So I've talked about how to get your market size I start talking about what the approaches might be, but how do you actually get the numbers to put to those approaches? And that comes to your sources. So the first source you kind of think about is third party reports, which might be consultant reports you can find online. It might be reports which you've specifically asked someone to do for you. You might have asked experts to do them. And typically these give you an idea about what the current market might be and some indication about the growth, who the customers are, kind of adoption rates. But the important part over here is trying to figure out which reports you can trust, which reports you can't trust. And there's usually some level of due diligence you can do yourself to give an idea of, okay, is this report done by someone like Gartner who do their magic quadrant reports, which are quite reliable in the tech industry? Is it done by something called ABCDE Consulting, which was formed a month ago? So it's just kind of doing a bit of due diligence yourself to see what is a legitimate report, because obviously investors are gonna to want to know where you're getting your data from actually. And then similarly, when you talk about the questions, it might be trying to understand, okay, where's the report come from? Is this, like I said, legitimate? And then also trying to understand what the report is really looking at. So there's often a tendency to see or to assume that the report is your entire market size. I'll give you an example, but take, for example, I'm an ag tech company, which is focusing very much on digital social media specific impressions. And I go to an investor and I tell them that, hey, my current market is the entire advertising industry. So that's probably not going to work because that might be your TAM, but that's not really your current market. So similarly, if you find a third party report, which might say, okay, the current entire global ad tech market is worth say $65 billion. That's probably not your current market. Your current market is probably a more drilled down version of it, which might be entire ad tech market purely focused on social or purely focused on social and digital impressions. So it's making sure if you do use these market reports, you aren't trying to exaggerate what your market size is, but actually focusing more and making sure the report is actually covering what your true market is. And other sources you can use, I think the first row is probably the more reliable and legitimate resources. So obviously official stats, no one's really gonna dispute government stats. If you say it's like an ONS statistic, investors tend to listen to you and tend to agree with it. Obviously like as time goes by and depending on which countries stats you're looking at and often depending upon which ministry is actually doing the stats, it might differ, but I typically say government stats are really good, especially when you're trying to get demographic data. So as an example, if you're looking at the number of people aged 18 to 30, government stats is probably the way to go. Um, the second is kind of industry reports, which is often a mix of conversations with people at a high level or senior positions in the company or division leaders. Again, important thing to note with industry experts is a CEO of an insurance company is probably an industry expert. Um, an insurance agent focusing on one type of insurance in some random village probably isn't an expert on the entire insurance industry. They might be an expert on what they do, but not the maybe not the entire industry. So it's really important to understand who an expert is and how you define them. And then obviously company data, which is 
whatever publicly available data is available might be from competitor companies, might be from larger companies, might be from general company data and understanding. And that very much links into kind of your industry sources and broker research, which are both slightly harder to find often, but are also useful. And that's kind of like just stuff published online, might be white papers by company, might be press releases, might be thought leadership. And broker research is often stuff which is harder to access, but this is kind of stuff by maybe the big investment banks might have commissioned it. So you might have access to certain platforms which give you that data. But that's to give you an idea. There's a lot of data out there. The important part is understanding what data is relevant to you and what data is reliable, and then using that and applying that to the methodologies. And I think one really important thing to note, and I come to this over here, is that there will be discrepancies in different data sources. Everyone understands that any estimate of your market sizing isn't an accurate number that, hey, this is my exact market size. But it's important to kind of understand and give like a logical reasoning behind why that's the market size and how that works. A few examples at a very high level of bottom up. So again, if I look at like annual dog collar sales, little B to C, price of a dog collar multiplied by the number of dogs in the UK and the number of collars purchased, simple math. But obviously, when you start thinking about kind of B2B um, software, it gets a bit more complicated. So over here, if I look at, say, a restaurant booking software, your price might be your annual contract price. Your population of customers could be any restaurant which takes reservations, so kind of excluding takeaways. And then your purchases could just be the number of expected software sales based on industry reports. And I've also given you like an idea of what kind of stats I've used in the past to do something similar. So it's just been kind of a mix of three, four different sources and kind of just pulling them together. And if I maybe drill down into the B2B example slightly, I'm not going to go into too much detail because this example does tend to get a bit detailed. But if I think about something like, say, a restaurant booking SaaS software, it's quite important to understand what are the new sales you can have and what are the replacement rates. And I'm guessing a lot of the B2B, C, B2B businesses on the call are probably SaaS businesses. So it's quite important for you guys too, but it's important to understand what are the companies which aren't using your software currently, but might use your software or aren't using any software currently, but might use your software. And B is companies which are using competitor softwares, but might be inclined to replace it with your software if you push them and sell yourself well enough. And slightly going into more detail over here onto the assumption. So let's look at assumption one, which is let's assume there's a million new restaurants in the UK in any given year, which is your target. And then you've got an additional 100,000 new restaurants opening in the UK. Now, obviously that entire 1 million existing restaurants aren't people you will realistically get business from. It's probably a fraction of those. So then you come into the second assumption, which is 80% of this 1.1 million restaurants allow eating in because 20% are takeaway. Use industry reports to get that down. Then you talk about 75% of eat-ins will eventually buy booking software. And over here, I'm getting rid of that little 5%, like I mentioned earlier, which is people who will realistically never be expected to adopt the software. And in this scenario, that little 5% number, we got through expert interviews and using market research out there. So it's kind of just drilling that down. And then lastly is just what is the current penetration in the market for eat-ins and what percent of those 1 million existing restaurants actually use booking software, which is about 60% of that. And the next slide has a lot of maths, so I'm not going to go into detail on it, but I'm going to give you a minute to read through this and get an idea of what it says. But essentially at a high level, what it's saying is you split it up into the new restaurants or the new businesses, you split it up into the existing restaurants or existing businesses. With a new restaurant, you kind of put that 75% number to them because you're expecting that 75% of them can realistically use your software and there's no like competition over there. There will be competition when you're selling, but there's no existing incumbent competition. So that's kind of your 60K over here straight away done. But then when you start thinking about the existing users, that's where it gets a bit complicated for B2B SaaS. And this is where the breakdown I find is really useful. So let's look at it one by one over here. So B, is you take that 80%, so that's about 800,000 to allow eating in. You've broken that down into 60% to use a booking system. So that's 480K who use it. And then over here, you bring in a really interesting variable, which is kind of your contract length. And that depends on every industry, but I'd say for SaaS companies, typically it tends to be three years quite often. Um, for restaurant booking software, it's about four years, I've noticed. So you assume that every four years, these restaurants will replace their software, which means that it's not the 480k people who might buy your software, but it's probably a fourth of them who might buy your software this year. So it's kind of like I mentioned earlier, slightly drilling down on your market and getting a bit more technical with each stage to show that you've done your thinking, to show that you've used a logical approach to get where you have. And then I've come around to the second one, which is 
This is the 15% who might acquire a booking system, which gives you what is this 120K sales. And then over here, you're also trying to understand the 25% who never use a booking system, and you've kind of eliminated that number. And the way this translates very much into your TAM Samsung is, your TAM is basically every single eat-in restaurant, so you're just adding those numbers up. When you start talking about your SAM, you start drilling down into everything, but removing the people who will never buy the booking system, which is kind of your 25% at the end. But you don't start talking about the replacement rates just yet. And the replacement rates get really important when you start talking about your SOM or your current market of people you can target, because at this stage, you start thinking about who can you actually get. So you start getting that 120K number and you start spreading it out that way. So slightly complicated, feel free to take a photo or a screenshot of this to like get an idea of what this is. And I know John is going to be recorded, so you can always go back and have a more detailed read through this. I always find this is like a bit complicated because it takes some time to understand. And I'm sure John and Josh can help you in the future with this too. Um, but that's it. I think the last approach, I'm just going to quickly go through this, is kind of your supply based and how this works. But again, you think of a bigger market share, you kind of put the company one, two, three, four, five, what their market share is, add it up, apply a little percentages and try to understand what the total market might be. will not dwell on this too much because we don't often use this. And then again, the top down approach, a similar logic, like it's not easy to use this because it's quite hard to get accurate data. But one example of something we worked on, but, but essentially, specifically the travel market for Muslim travelers in the UK. And it's quite hard to do a bottom-up approach for it because the data is not easily available. So we did a top-down for this one, but we essentially looked at what's the total travel expenditure and we had reliable government reports for that. We looked at what was the share on travel spent by males within that. And then we did one further, which is the travel spent by Muslim males. And luckily this was a very demographic focused market size and so we could get the data, but it's quite rare that you can get such accurate data for a lot of industries, especially if you're a disruptive company. Um, that's kind of my approach on market sizing done, and hopefully it'll give you a little feeder of what market sizing is and how it works. And I'm going to kind of move into market growth now, which is very much looking at where your market is growing. So what market growth means is it's showing that, say, you've talked about your SAM and you're saying your SAM is, say, 10 billion, but your current market is, say, 1 billion. You want to show how fast you can get your SAM. Because if you're telling an investor, hey, this is my current market of 1 billion, my SAM is 10 billion, that little leftover 9 billion, I'm going to get it. But you're not really explaining how you're going to get it and when you're going to get it. You might be thinking in your mind, oh, I'm going to get it in the next 50 years. That's obviously not going to work for an investor because their timelines are probably closer to four to six years. So you need to show that yearly market growth. And usually this is not very easy to explain. So you can use market reports often to show this growth, but quite often this might come into your volume and your price drivers and using that to explain market growth. So if I go into this one over here, which is volume and price are basically the two key drivers of market growth. So if there's something which is impacting your volume, either positively or negatively, your market growth is going to go up and down. Similarly, if it's a price which is going up and down, that's going to kind of impact how fast you're growing because it shows how willing people are to buy it. And this gets into a bit more of the pure unit economic side of market sizing, which is quite, I guess, statsy focused, but kind of understanding, I guess, price and volume and how that impacts demand and supply in a market. And just on the point of demand and supply, I guess, if I move into an example of a growth driver, so this is kind of for an EV car company, but if you look at just a few of these bits and pieces, something like technology, which shows that like technology is evolving, there are more EV providers out there, people are more willing to buy EV, that's kind of a positive market growth. But then similarly, replacement rates, which is like EV vehicles are lasting longer, people aren't buying them as often. So it's going like negative 2%. So it's kind of like balancing that out and getting an idea. And again, I always stress this point, like it's hard to get accurate information, but as long as you've got a logical approach, you've used reliable data, and you can explain why you've got to a market size or why you've got to a rate in a good way, usually an investor will understand and in the due diligence phases, they're probably gonna to wanna to drill down into it anyway. And then I guess on the price side, just an example, brand power, I mean, a Tesla, probably 20 years ago, you probably wouldn't have spent a premium of 10, 15,000 just to buy a Tesla. Now, just because it's kind of like a status symbol, it's a fashion symbol, people want Teslas, not just for the environment, but also because it looks cool. So that kind of also impacts your price and impacts your growth. I'm gonna kind of try to use the next 10, 12 minutes or so, which I have left to now actually go into what the implications are for fundraising and what the implications are for your value proposition. I know, and I'm conscious I'm trying to cover a lot of bits and pieces into this one session, uh, but hopefully you can follow up after. Uh, so implications of fundraising. So you've heard about market sizing, you've heard about how to do it, what investors think about it, 
but let's talk about how that actually um, feeds into when you're going for a fundraising round. So what a good investor deck or even when you're having investor conversation needs is pure and simple articulated market size, data rich, should have some good evidence, should have examples as far as possible of both competitors, but also other people in the industry. And also when you talk about growth, you should be able to explain why this market is growing and talk about your volume and your price drivers. And so what do investors really expect to see, which is very much, as I mentioned the previous one, which is you're able to represent and define your market based on your software. You're able to understand the size of the market backed up by research. You're able to show that little headroom between your current market and your SAM as far as relevant. And you're able to, again, be ambitious about your market size, but again, be realistic. Always remember, investors are gonna do their due diligence. You don't wanna to lie to them or try to like exaggerate it too much in the beginning because two months later, when you're going to due diligence, you've got your term sheet, they're gonna find out that you were lying, they're gonna find out that you were exaggerating and it's just gonna come back and bite you. So be honest, be ambitious, but be realistic. And lastly, think about the investor profile. Think about what the investor you're targeting cares about the most. So typically I've seen a lot of VCs care much more about your SAM because they want to see that growth over the next five years and they like to have their 10X returns. They like to have that unicorn potential. EIS VCT might be okay focusing a bit more on your SOM and like some extent your SAM because they're okay with maybe like a 5X return. If you talk about angels, angels probably tend to look at your current market because that investment period might be shorter and they might be looking for like helping you build a product or helping you target something on a smaller scale. And then obviously family offices and corporate venture capital funds all have their own interests in mind. So it's good to do a bit of research online and try to understand what they really care about and tailor your presentation slightly when you speak to them and help them understand how you're going to add the most value to their portfolio. So just as an overview of market sizing, so you've got your definitions, you've got your industry, your market, the needs you're serving, kind of using those approaches, getting your TAM SAM SOM. You've got your market sizing, which is using that, getting your actual market size, and then obviously feeding into your growth and fundraising, which is why is now a good time to target the market? And this links into some concepts around product market fit, which you might have heard about earlier, but kind of showing why is now the right time to target that market? Why is now the growth stage of the market? How are you going to grab this much in the next three to five years? And you can often be quite realistic about it because take for example if you're a commission based model you're not going to get the entire market you're going to get a commission based of it so as an example if you're a food delivery company your market isn't going to be 50 billion which is the food market it's going to be probably five percent of 50 billion which is the commission based on the entire food market so it's important to understand what your real market is rather than what the entire market is which you're servicing and then showing where that would go in the next three to five years and just an example of how you can put something like that on a slide. So obviously I showed you the simple versions of that, but a slightly more complicated version incorporating a bit more detail could be something like this, just an example. And I just wanna call out, I guess, a few key things over here, which is you're kind of showing there's a huge market at the top. You're getting that really attention of the investor. You're kind of showing what the industry size is in the top right and kind of showing, okay, this is what the percent could be. This is what the value could be. You're giving them some benchmarks to show that you've done your thinking. You've looked at other competitors. You looked at other people in the space and it's like, a realistic projection. You've looked at your actual market. So your, again, current market, SAM and your TAM and kind of shown that and explained that. And obviously you've kind of at the end over here shown like a growth rate. So as an example, in this scenario, their target market was the UK. So they've kind of shown how the market is increasing as time goes by. Hopefully that kind of covers off market sizing. And in the last few minutes, I'm going to cover off value proposition, which essentially is you've talked about your market. You've talked about how the market is going to add value to the investor, how it's going to add value to the customer, how it's going to grow, how you're going to make money. But a really core part of market sizing is actually explaining to them why your product is useful to a customer, why your product is better or as good as competitors and showing the value of your actual product. And this will probably lean in well into any other future sessions you might have around valuation and understanding that. So this is a really good quote from I think Piper VC, which I know we've used a lot, but it's when you're looking at brands, they ask themselves, are you better and are you different than the competition? And your value proposition is very much that. It's what are you doing better than the market or what features or services you're providing, which are providing either a better user experience, better value, um, a range of other features which might actually make someone choose you over your competitors. And the thing is like this value proposition isn't something which is static, like it's not something which stays purely within your market sizing element of your business, but it's something which very much flows through your entire pitch deck or your entire story of your business. Because I like to think your story of your company starts very much at the value proposition stage. This is the value we want to deliver to the client. 
and then you break it down into problem solution, your business model, understanding how the market works. So value proposition market flows very much through your entire deck and through any conversation you might have with an investor. And as an example of what a value proposition might be over here, so Uber, very much the value proposition is get a cab anytime you want it. This is obviously a bit outdated, but as time has evolved, it's kind of gone into, we're providing it better than our competitors. We have more taxis than someone like say maybe Bolt or Ola. We have more or we have better security measures in place. It's kind of understanding how that value proposition is evolving. Similarly, it doesn't just have to be something new in the market. An example is like Body Shop, where basically there were lots of other players in the market, but their focus very much became that they're the sustainable alternative. They're kind of like the sustainable organization, which is providing these bots and body services, but in a better way. So it's kind of trying to figure out what you're providing better than your competitor. It doesn't have to be solely a financial benefit to the client, it could be a range of benefits, but it's really important to understand that because like I said, it flows through your entire deck pretty much from beginning to the end. And again, like just an Airbnb example over here, which is rather than a hotel, you're using something which is someone's house and you're actually getting easier access and more access to accommodation. And just probably gonna end on this one slide, um, just around value proposition, but also market, which is a Rolex example. So I know this is kind of like a team favorite example among us, but Rolex, really old brand, it's been around for what, probably more than a hundred years now. And they obviously had a market size for watches. They had a market size for people looking to buy functional watches about 100 years ago. And their market was based on their value proposition, which is that Rolex creates watches which are high tech. They've got really cool innovation. They function much better than competitors. They're convenient. They're good priced. And that was about 100 years ago. But if you think about Rolex right now, do you really think of buying a Rolex? So hypothetically, if I was like, I want a watch which is really functional, I want a watch which won't go bad, I'm going to buy a Rolex. That's probably not your instant connection to the Rolex brand. Usually, if you're buying a Rolex in today's day and age, it's kind of like a status symbol to some extent. It's something you buy with, hey, I've got a big bonus, I'm going to buy a Rolex, or hey, I've made partner at a firm, I'm going to buy a Rolex. And that's because Rolex has managed to understand that their market is changing and managed to change their value proposition as that market has changed. So what they did was about 50, 60 years ago now, they realized that this was changing and they realized that there were other competitors now who could provide a similar service for a similar price. So they decided to kind of start pivoting to becoming a luxury brand, brand and trying to show that like, this is something which famous people wear. So what they did was kind of the OG influencer marketing move over here, which is 50, 60 years ago, they just sent Rolexes to a lot of different famous people and those people started wearing a Rolex. And it was kind of like, hey, this celebrity is wearing a Rolex. That's kind of a status, a symbol status and kind of like status for high society. And they kind of managed to evolve their product that way. So a hundred years ago, Rolex was a functional watch. Their market was anyone buying a watch in the market. Now their market and their kind of proposition is functioned to this is a branded product. It's kind of a high-end watch. It's recognizable. People want to buy it. Their market is probably more of like the high-end customers now. So it's just kind of understanding that your market might be something right now, your value proposition might be something right now, but you should be prepared not to completely change it, but be prepared to understand how the volume and price and everything else in the wider market is shifting. So you can change your market and value proposition accordingly. I've gone through a lot of bits and pieces today. I'm really hoping that was a useful high level overview of how market sizing works, how value proposition works, how investors care about it. Hopefully after the session, you can kind of absorb it, rewatch the video if you need to, and try to like do a bit of jotting in your mind about what's our market, what it could be, what a value proposition could be, and hopefully helps you get a better idea of what you're targeting and where your business is going. So market reports, where's the best place to go and find market reports? Because they're fundamental to proving the information that you're actually uh, putting out there. Yeah, so short answer, they aren't easy to find. You have to do a fair amount of digging and research but my answer is quite often, Google is your best friend. Start Googling stuff, start looking for market reports, start looking at more legitimate sources. So quite often you can A, look at some of your competitors and try to understand how they got their numbers for. So quite often you'll see at the bottom of a lot of pages, there'll be a little source, um, little colon, and then explaining what the source is using that. B, trying to do some general research. So a lot of consulting firms will write reports about markets and write reports about where they got that data from. So using those. And I think even more generally, a lot of market reports might be stuff you need to get externally. So it might be finding a consultancy, might be finding a research advisor to actually get those market reports. 
But I do think a lot of the publicly available reports, as an example, government stats and government reports, which I mentioned, is stuff you can quite literally find on the ONS website. You go on there, you search demographic data, do a bit of digging, and there you are. I do think the reason I kind of stress that there's not a single answer to finding market reports is there is a level of research you need to do to find a market report. I mean, in my previous consulting days, we would have companies who literally spend two months with us just to get a market size. But obviously, at your stage of companies, you probably can't do that. You don't have the resources to spend it. So see what you can find realistically online. If there's something you can pay a little bit of money to get, go for it. Use government statistics and get as reasonable a market size as you can. And probably just reiterating my previous point, which is investors aren't expecting a precise, my market is $4.1275 million or whatever. They're expecting a high level market size with logical reasoning behind why you've got there. Hopefully that's useful. Yes, that is. Thank you very much, Jay. It reminds me, actually, I was doing some market research on uh, products into the US and the US State Department. Wonderful people. They publish everything. So you could actually drill down. You, not only did you know what sector that was being uh, imported into every single state into the US, it, you could even, even break it down by product code. So you could actually work out how many microchips were being shipped into Houston, for example, and things like that. It, it, fantastic information is available there. If you only you just go and look, it's all down to research, 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 isn't it? So that, I mean, so one of the questions here was, uh, you know, do you have any resources that you would suggest to be able to find data of how often businesses are purchasing certain goods? But again, that comes down to the market reports either the sector specific or where you're going with it. So I've got, I've got a little question here come through um, about SAM or TAM. Are there any limitation for SAM or TAM, i.e. 10% of current market value? How do you assess what percentage of SAM or TAM that you can actually obtain? Um, very much up to you, I'd say. Again, one of the things with market sizing where there's no right or wrong answer. If you as a business think your product is good enough to obtain 10%, fair enough. That's kind of your prerogative. And I'm assuming you've done some thinking about why you're doing that. Often the way I often think about it is kind of looking at, have we displaced other competitors? What kind of market size they might have? Quite often thinking about how much can you realistically sell based on your team? So as an example, if you're saying, I'm gonna get 10% of SAM in the next two years, Think about, do you realistically have the resources to get 10% of SAM? And often think about it in the other way, which is thinking about what level of sales are you making right now? How many clients do you have and how much you realistically expect to sell to those clients? So quite often I think about it the other way around, which is what do I have right now? How many clients do I expect to have in maybe five years time? And then try to work my way backwards from there when I talk about what percent of a market I'm trying to target. And I think it, it, it's also about competition as well. Um, there's a question here from Les. Uh, they have a biotech technology that's first to market. Now, that's always a tricky area to market size. So um, they're looking for a potential market size that is credible when the figure will ultimately be based on a guesstimate of what market share we can obtain. There are no directly comparable technology introductions as it tends to be evolution rather than revolutionary new product introductions. Quite a lengthy question, quite technical. I don't expect you to have an instant answer for that one, but let's break it down. Biotech yeah. company, and it's an evolution rather than a revolutionary new product. Sure. How would you go about that fundamentally? So, I guess one thing from my side, I don't consider myself an expert in biotech purely because I find the biotech company angle is quite different to pretty much any other company, especially with market sizing biotech, given that a lot of the work is very much groundbreaking, something which has never been done before. It's hard to really identify what the market is. I can give you an example with a company I spoke to some time ago about how they did it, but essentially they were doing CAR T therapies for a very specific type of, I think it was a second line of defense cancer treatment. And what they did was they tried to understand how many people get to that level of cancer treatments. So as an example, if they were maybe under the NHS, approximately 80,000 people currently under cancer treatment, out of which maybe say 12,000 were doing second line of therapy treatment. And then out of that, I tried to understand there's about 12,000 people within that treatment. That's kind of understanding who are the potential people who might use our treatment. So with biotech companies, it's a bit harder to do, but I think it's kind of 
good to get an idea of what is happening in a country. I think NHS data, you can quite often find that online. That's a good way to understand it. I'm not sure what is happening in this specific company situation, but that's probably the way you do it. And the second thing is probably thinking about what could you reasonably say? So again, it's going to be a guesstimate. Everyone understands that, but try to think about is your technology based on something else? So again, if I'm talking about CAR T therapies, what is the typical market size or what's the typical targeting for maybe some other CAR T therapy in the market? And I might do something similar, like what's the typical market size for say like cancer therapies in the market and try to guess it that way. And typically what you'll notice with biotech companies, a lot of investors or a lot of generalist investors don't actually invest in biotech companies, but it's more like the slightly more specialist biotech investors. And you can often go to them with just a high level market size and kind of once you start explaining to them the technical aspects of it, they often will help you drill down into it. Yes, yeah, so and we use the area health science networks quite a lot because their expertise in this field is unsurpassed. And effectively, if they don't know the answer, they certainly know whether you can go and research it and possibly even get you a grant to research it. So it's a double whammy. That's good. So talking about competitors now, uh, Cassie has come up with a, a follow up question about comp competition and they've been basing their market growth on competitors growth on other disruptive companies driving growth in the market. And basically their investor feedback is, don't use that as an example. Have you got any examples of where people have been successful using other competitors' growth in the market? So there are, I wouldn't say you rely purely on competitor market growth. I think it's a good way to kind of give you an idea and a bit of a ballpark figure on what your growth might be. But I would say very much base your growth on your volume and price drivers and publicly available market research. So as an example, if I maybe go back to my HR SaaS example, if I'm an HR SaaS software, I have some certain competitors, XYZ, also selling HR SaaS software, expecting to grow by 5 to 10%. I try to understand what their volume and price drivers are, which is driving their 5 10% growth. And then I think of those volume and price drivers, see if any of those apply to me, what are the other volume and price drivers which might apply to my business and try to get my growth from that basis. Or I try to do a wider, try to understand what the HR SaaS market might be and how the entire market is growing, and then try to see what your disruption or what your differentiation is and how that kind of impacts the market growth. Again, it's not a definitive number, your market growth. It's something which you're estimating. I would say don't purely rely on your competition, but you can use your competition to get an idea of what it could be in that area and then use that to build your own market growth model. Yes, and whilst we're still on the subject of competition, because when you're actually doing your market sizing, if you're in a highly competitive market, you're in the Red Sea, as we call it, not the Blue Ocean. Uh, the Red Sea being full of sharks, but the Blue Ocean being there and a vast expanse able to expand in any direction. And so it's quite tricky to do your market sizing when you're in a highly competitive market because um, there are other factors that come into play price, availability switching, churning, all that kind of stuff that comes on. So um, would you recommend going into a crowded marketplace with a new product? That's your decision. I mean, I've seen people go into very crowded marketplaces and do a really great job out of it. I think what matters is how you're differentiating from your competitors is probably the big thing in my mind and how you're really adding additional value. So I'm trying to think of like a good example to give for that. Um, if I think of something as simple as ad tech, to be honest, there's a million ad tech companies out there. There's a new one every minute, probably starting out. But a lot of the ad tech companies do get venture investment and they're always really hot in the venture capital space, especially with certain investors. And what usually happens is they might have a differentiation on the way they target the market. So as an example, you might have ad tech company X, which is focusing on using cookie less targeting and using essentially what information is available on a single web page. There might be company two, which is using or tracking your mouse movements or tracking what you type on a keyboard to help give you advertisements. So there could be other players in the market. I think it's important to understand what the entire market size is. So something like ad tech, the market size is worth 50, 60 billion, which means there's scope for growth and there's not like one or two players who've taken up that bigger market share. So in essence, what I'm saying is you can enter a new market, just make sure you understand your value proposition, like I said, and understand how you're differentiating yourself from competition and just trying to focus on those bits and pieces which 
help kind of like differentiate you from other people in that market. It remains for me to say thank you very much, Jay, for presenting from PwC Raise Ventures. And yes, we can pass your details on to Jay if you wish us to do so. Just let us know on our uh, email address of uez at essex.ac.uk. And we don't have any more questions, any open questions, but yes, as Josh said, we've got lots of thank yous coming through. So thank you very much, Jay, and we fully appreciate the audience.